So how's it going, David? It's going good. It's going good. We're uh, past the end of tax season now. So I guess that's good for all our listeners. Good for all those who had to do taxes. You and I, of course, are are lucky in that. Well, do you do, you do your own taxes? Do my own taxes, yes. Yes. So <laughs> I, I, I think I got those done a week early. <laughs> yeah, I filed an extension. I just finished mine this weekend. Um, and, and actually, it's funny. I, I filed my extension and I tried to pay with my extension, uh, TurboTax, of course. And uh, the IRS systems uh, were crashed on tax day, as you may well recall. And That's so right. they, everybody got a bonus day, right? Yeah, so they didn't, my, my payment and extension got rejected and I, I had to redo it again the next day. So I was freaking out for a little bit there. Well, did you kind of think it was you only or were you aware that there was bigger issues? Uh, I, hadn't, I wasn't really paying attention to the news. And so I didn't, I didn't realize that, uh, that you know, the, the IRS systems had crashed. And then I read this article in Accounting Today about how uh, the IRS needs a new computer system. And I, I was blown away to find out that the systems that the IRS are using are still the original systems that were put in place 60 years ago. And it, the master taxpayer file that has all of our names and social security numbers and whatever is, uh, is written in assembly code, which is, you know, that's like, like the Voyager spacecraft and whatnot were programmed in assembly, I believe. So it's the oldest system in place in the federal government other than our nuclear systems. Uh, and if you, if you want to check out this article, you got to see it. It's it, put it in the show notes. Um, kind of amazing. I, I mean, it's not the IRS's fault, really. We can't blame them. Can we for having this system when they've been underfunded for so long, but it is really shocking. So finally, um, uh, the Congress as a result has, has passed some legislation, uh, to give the IRS, uh, some, some new computer systems. So hopefully we'll see that soon. We won't have a repeat of this year. It'd be interesting because like, I think like when this happens too, like some of these old developers that maybe are the only ones that can do that assembly programming language, right? Like, like there, there's a very small percentage, but they can make really good money. So, if, <laughs> well, the problem is they're all dying. Yeah, right? exactly. There's, there's, there's not a, not, there's no competition, right? Like you <laughs> name your price to the IRS. They need you still. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what else is new? Uh, it's interesting that, uh, just to make this reminds me of um so at Cooper's Connect in London, we had somebody come in from I think it's called the Her Majesty's Tax Agency, whatever it's called in London, right? The uh the the IRS of, of England, of of the UK. And uh they they have their big making tax digital initiative. And she came on to talk about all the changes they're doing. And it felt like a Silicon Valley pitch right? Like they're talking about how they're going to have APIs and just on and on. That this, so this, this article here, like, oh, we have a 50-year-old computer system. It's kind of, you know, I'm pretty sure there's probably somebody at the IRS kind of starting the same plan, right? Like they'll be, they'll be coming to one of these big conferences pitching IRS and their APIs and their, uh, their future because we'll, we're eventually going to get tax digital as well one day. One day. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of, it kind of reminded me of that. But, um, so I, yeah, I have an article. It's kind of similar, right. To yours. Uh, it's, it's, uh, about a CPA and, uh, almost all his, uh, returns he was filing for his clients were getting rejected. Uh -oh. that they were already filed. And so kind of like you filed late and you couldn't get through in the computer system. That, that was kind of the IRS's fault. This one really wasn't the IRS's fault. The, uh, there's a great uh, story. It's, it's a security story. It's kind of a lesson. And so, this accountant, unbeknownst to him, he may have been infected for almost nine to 10 months with a keylogger. And so a keylogger, as you know, it's going to record everything you type. Even if you mistype something and hit the backspace, it just records everything you're typing. And then along the way, it'll do screenshots, right? And so- Wait, wait. So how did he get infected? Uh, I think the article is pretty straightforward. He clicked on an email attachment probably from uh -huh. a client or a coworker or something like that. So- so he had a program on his computer that was just capturing everything he was typing. Yes. And so the story, this article actually has screenshots from his PC because pretty much that data that's being recorded was for sale. So somebody could go in and get all of this. So it's a historical record of this infection, if you want to call it an infection, right? And it, it goes all the way through and it, it goes all the way to the point where it talks about 
how he was creating letters to write to his clients, like those were captured to tell his clients that their tax returns got rejected and that they need to file a fraud claim with the, uh, with the IRS, et cetera, et cetera. So, but after about 20 of those, then it finally has screenshots of when he downloaded anti-spyware software to check his own machine. And that's when he discovered he was compromised. But everything up to that point till he was not compromised is basically all out there available for somebody to download. And it's all indexed very well by the client's names, et cetera. So the, the identity thieves purposely created a virus just for accountants. Wow. To harvest accountants' data. But it's, uh, it's a little scary and disturbing when you start looking at the screenshots and you can see everything that this person has done over those eight. Now, not everything is in there over the last eight months, but you really get a picture of the, the detail level that uh, exposure that happened. So, so wait, these uh, screenshots and, and um, whatnot, they were on a public website? Is that how the, the is that how this um, journalist got a hold of them? Uh, we could call it public website. And maybe it's like a website to buy illegal things. Mm. I, I don't know exactly you know. where where I don't go. I'm not a cyber criminal, so oh. I don't I don't go to these websites. But I know they exist, and apparently there's a I call it they call it the malware crypting service. Got it. Well, so uh, I'm reading this article now, and. It says that, of course, this guy hadn't updated his computer. He had neglected his Windows updates and Microsoft updates. Of course, that's a terrible idea, but we're all guilty of it. Um, who has time during busy season to you know, shut off their computer for 20 minutes while it updates, right? But, I think he got infected months before that, though. Months before busy season. Well, it must be, it must be just something that he does as a, as a practice. So. Yeah. Uh, keep your computers up to date is a lesson here. And uh, what else, you know, what else can CPAs do to protect themselves from these kind of attacks? I think it's due diligence. You can't click on things. You have to kind of almost run the assumption like your people are trying to attack you mm -hmm. right, in a way, and, and just be really smart about it and constantly on the lookout for just assume everything anybody sends you smells. Right. Yeah. Just don't click on it. It's, it's, you know, just lead with that. Uh, treat it like food. Right. Okay. Another uh, option that I've heard of, um, haven't done it myself is uh, switch to a virtual desktop hosting service. So um, one of the companies that does this is Abacus Next. I don't know if you've heard of them. Yeah. Um, but it, it basically turns your laptop into a, a, like just a monitor and a keyboard and you log into your virtual Windows desktop in the cloud, and they maintain all of the security. There's a number of vendors that do this. I think Right Networks does it too. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like outsourcing your IT work, yeah. right, to, to somebody else to handle. But I think even one of those players last summer, maybe not even last summer, maybe last fall. Oh, it was Cloud9. Got, they got compromised, yeah. and it was even worse because that spread from, instead of just one person's virtual computer being compromised, it spread from, there's to a bunch of other people's virtual computers. So even that is not really a guaranteed way to protect. Um, it's shameful though, because you're paying somebody else to not get infected to, to watch this for you. And it still occurred. So I think, you know, it's definitely going to always occur and it, it's. Well, I think in that particular instance, I do recall it was, uh, it was shared hosted environments got compromised. If you have your own virtual server, then that couldn't happen because there's okay. like a, a sandboxing that goes on. So I think if you, if you pay for your own virtual server and you have a company monitoring it, that's probably the safest course of action. But yeah, like you said, you're always at risk. Yeah. And key loggers are interesting too, because even if you're in the cloud, it's just logging what you're typing. Like it, it's, it's, it's like something inner, like basically taking your keyboard and just recording everything you're, you're doing. And, and so that brings up another way to protect yourself against a keylogger is to use multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication is the other word for it. Um, and most apps these days support it. Uh, so it's, it's that, that thing where when you log in, you put in your username and your password, you also get a text message code sent to you and you have to put in that, that code in order to log in. So that means that even if somebody got your password through a keylogger, and they, if they tried to log in, they still wouldn't have your phone because they, they physically are not there, right? So that's another way to protect yourself. 
like if all of your apps are multi-factor enabled. So and that, yeah, that keeps from somebody trying to sign in using your, yeah, if, if they're able to, you know, get your username and password. I, I think maybe it's even on the apps, right? Because these, they're recording the screen, they're recording the key logs. And so they're, they're not even trying to get the guy's username and passwords for sites he goes to. They're just getting people's names and social security numbers so they can file fraudulent tax returns, right? And so it's, yep. so then it's like, okay, how do you even, should we as an industry think about how do you scrabble that stuff up on the screen so it can't be recorded at all? Right? Right. Or, or is it where maybe returns, it's kind of weird, right? Is there possible like with blockchain or something like that where like the end-to-end -end process, this gets done through a hash and nobody ever gets to see the social security number anywhere along the process. Yeah, well, we definitely need a better system than social security numbers for protecting our information with the government, right? Because those are basically public now. It's really hard to keep your social security number private. Or you just have a 50-year-old computer system that people can't hack, which is, pro which is actually probably more secure. <laughs> Nobody can hack it. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure that the uh, indiv individual master taxpayer file is, is stored in you know, that Mission Impossible vault from the film. You have to go down on a cable in order to get in there. Yeah. The um, other thing with that article, too, is uh, now it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a long-form article to read, but then there's a lot of comments on it. Uh, so definitely, um, and then people actually talk about like public notaries and like just there's so much data that's out there that people aren't careful with. Hey, so uh, something else that's new is uh, I just got back from Sweet World in Las Vegas. That was last week. NetSuite Oracle big conference. That was a lot of fun. And so that is uh, NetSuite's high-end corporations like nobody's small businesses isn't using this stuff like this is high-end big time. yeah so it's you know the definition of the word small business is funny because a small business is really according to the government anything that's not enterprise yeah right? Where, and of course that that means you know one employee up to thousands and thousands of employees so for our purposes um i would say that you know netsuite's an erp system and it appeals to you know, companies with a few hundred employees up to several thousand in general. So that, that was the audience for this conference. And it was my first time at a conference for uh, you know, this, this audience, a big conference, lots of money because Oracle acquired NetSuite about a year and a half ago. So they put on some pretty awesome pyrotechnics, um, 7,500 people in attendance. Wow. Um, so the thing, that, the thing that was interesting to me about uh, going to the keynotes, I've been to both ZeroCon many times and uh, QuickBooks Connect. And even though this conference was, uh, had more people than either of those, um, I felt like the, the audience was not quite as enthusiastic <laughs> as you get at, at uh, uh, QuickBooks Connect or ZeroCon. Um, and I, I, I was trying to understand why that is. And I think it's because NetSuite, by its nature, appeals to a very broad audience uh, as an ERP system. It has many different types of users. It has a huge IT audience that attends. And whenever they re release features, some are going to be of interest to a small portion. Very little is of interest to everyone. So you don't get that you know, cheering moment when, when a, a big new feature is announced, say that you know, like a big QuickBooks feature is announced or something like that. So that was interesting to me. But it seemed like you know in the expo hall, there were just hundreds and hundreds of vendors, and so it was it was it was fascinating because you're, you're we're now seeing this whole ecosystem of apps develop in the in the mid market space that really started with zero on QuickBooks in the small business space. Um, di mostly different vendors. There were some there that you see it at the uh, the small business shows like uh, Expensify, Bill.com, and whatnot. Um, but but kind of a different set of vendors. And it was really cool to see you know, everyone going around and, and learning a lot about them and, and integrating, figuring out how they can integrate these apps into their systems and make their companies more efficient. Um, so it was, it was really cool to attend as a vendor. I've always in the past, um, you know, gone as, a, as an accountant. So that was interesting seeing the other side, hanging out at the booth with the Flowcast crowd and whatnot. Cool. And uh, it's funny because I think... Uh you know, as you describe like the vendors that are there and how they're now getting to that app ecosystem 
that is being built that was led. But as one of the tweets you have captured from uh, Lori McCabe has uh, apparently they have feedback widget built into their thing, so you can put a little happy face or a sad face, and and you know and give feedback to to, to Netsuite right from inside. And it's kind of like oh yeah, like getting feedback from your customers. Like we were doing like all the other apps were doing that a decade yeah. ago, right? Yeah. And, and and it's almost comical because like it's NetSuite, right? It's Oracle. And now there's happy and sad faces you can click on inside the product to say how you're feeling based on that feature. Yeah, they're, they're clearly learning from what's going on uh, with the other apps in the ecosystems already. And, and that's a perfect example of a feature they've kind of co-opted. Um, just like there's features from ERPs that you're starting to see in, in QuickBooks and Xero now. Um, I've got a few of the latest features that are interesting from Sweet World. Um, they're starting to do analytics uh, directly in the application that's called Suite Analytics. That's um, a feature that's in beta. It's, you know, speaking of the speed at which these things happen, uh, they announced this feature about, I think, seven years ago, and they're finally releasing it this year. So it shows you that the, the pace of change in mid-market systems can be a bit slow, um, but it's exciting to actually see it in action. So now you can, you can basically create uh, pivot tables based on your your data in NetSuite and save those and see those as reports over and over again, which is pretty cool. So you don't have to export to Excel. Got it. And I, it, and I saw there's uh, tons of country support right happening. In NetSuite. Yes, yes. Now, sir. are they all there? Do they get a turnout of like people from all over the globe at this conference? Um, or uh, you know, I I don't I couldn't really. It seemed like it seemed like a, a diverse crowd, uh, but I couldn't tell if if those were people who are living here or from abroad. Okay. Um, but there were some cheers out um, in the crowd when um, when they announced the globalization or the localizations, I should say, the global local, localizations of NetSuite. So um, the big ones, uh, the big one is China. Now that Oracle's behind NetSuite, they're taking it global, and so they're gonna they're doing improved localizations for China and Japan, and Germany, France, Brazil, and Mexico. Those are the big ones they're doing. So it's pretty cool if you're a company that. As subsidiaries all over the world, you can have them all on NetSuite now is the idea and, and consolidate them all instantly. And that's one of the big value props of a system like that. So just for my own brain and maybe some people that might be having the same question. So, you know, obviously QuickBooks and Zero Windows where they kind of fit in the picture, right? And then is Inact like kind of that in between that and NetSuite or is Inact kind of equal to NetSuite? Where's that kind of fall in? Yeah, it's interesting. They, they, I would say that Intact and NetSuite are on the same level, um, or, or they're competing for the same types of businesses. And, okay. and a lot of the reason that you go to one of those is because you have multiple entities that you have to consolidate, and you can have them all in the same file as opposed to having like a separate QuickBooks file for each of them, and then consolidating separately. Um, that's a huge perk. But um, Intact and NetSuite seem to be taking different approaches to solving the challenge of a cloud general ledger for mid-market companies. Intact is really more of a general ledger solution and less of an ERP. So they don't try to do everything. At least they haven't historically. Who knows if that's going to change now that Sage is behind them. Got it. Intact has always taken the suite approach. So the idea is they want to have you run your entire business in NetSuite all the way from your online store. And that was one of the announcements at uh, Sweet World is now you can build an online e-commerce website inside of NetSuite. And you can do it, they say, in 30 days if you're a NetSuite customer, which is a pretty big deal because a lot of times those kind of rollouts take months and months and months. So the idea is with a suite, you could have your online store integrated with your inventory in NetSuite, integrated with your general ledger, integrated with your HR, like it's all in one place. Um, but that's a fundamentally different concept than the idea of having your general ledger as one solution and then using third-party add-ons for everything else, which tends to be more the intact approach. Got it, got it, got it. So yeah, they're, they're, they're going to be just be the GL and let a bunch of other apps build out that. Whatever pieces, almost custom um, MRPs, right? Just for everybody yep. else. MRPs, got it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's really interesting to see what's going to happen. Um, you know, along those lines, 
NetSuite announced more features, including uh, they're going to do global tax calculations. So they're building out something called everything starts with Suite. So this is Suite Tax, and they're going to you're going to be able to do tax calculations in 140 countries, all within NetSuite. So again, very global approach. And, and then they're building their own. They pretty much building it on their own. So instead of using a third party service like an Avalair or something like that, there's like we're building all the sales tax cal nexus calculations in house. Exactly, which is again a different approach than approach, saying yeah. let's let's have third party partners do all of this. Got it. Cool. No, I think that helps. It, uh, yeah. it get a picture of what it is. Uh, any any uh, celebrities there? Did they get any celebrities or bands? Uh, it was uh, Magic Johnson was the keynote okay. speaker on Thursday. Unfortunately, I had to leave on Wednesday, so I didn't get to see him. Okay. He who's at Quickbooks Connect once. He's great. Great. Really, really good. Good keynote speaker. He was great. Cool. And of course, um, it wouldn't be a cloud accounting conference if they didn't talk about automation and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So of course there were promises about building that into the uh, suite, although no actual uh, live demonstrations, more just product direction, but, but interesting examples of how they might be able to use machine learning. Um, one of the examples I really liked was the idea of uh, having dynamic pricing on your e-commerce store that is based on artificial intelligence. So like you wouldn't have to go in and reprice items. You could tell NetSuite to do it for you. And, and it would like look at, I don't know, trends all over the world that it can ingest and then decide what is the appropriate price for this item so that you make the most profit. Wow. That's, so there's like a lot of smaller niche apps that do that. And so they're, they're just going to build it as part of their stack, which is just even more like, like, where does it end? Yeah. <laughs> like, like well, what are they going to not build? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we'll see if that actually plays out and they actually build something like that. But that's, that was a, a an example of something of a way they could integrate machine learning and artificial intelligence into the app. Uh, but again, given that it took seven years for the analytics module to get built, we'll see how long it takes for this AI to, get integrated. I, I say this all, things just take time. I mean, yeah. it, it, it just, everything well, just takes time. I think there should be a ban on developers announcing planned features at conferences. You should only be allowed to show actual product. I, I think Microsoft set the tone for that like in 1982 and <laughs> it, that's just how it's been forever. <laughs> well, hey, David, I think that's all we had time for today. It was great talking to you. Yeah. And so, uh, I think this is getting back on track. So you and I, we're going to do this every week now. Is that yeah. the, we're committed here? This is the new cloud accounting podcast is you and me every week talking about the latest cloud accounting news. Even if there isn't any, we'll make it up. <laughs> and then maybe we try to have a guest here and there. We'll do a, a bonus episode or something. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to keep, keep talking with the thought leaders in the accounting profession. It'll be even easier with the two of us ganging up on them. It should be a lot of fun. And then we have work to do, right? Like we need to make sure we have an email address so people can send us articles. We got to spin up smart work. We got a lot of work to do. <laughs> it, it'll happen eventually. We'll get that going. But, but for now, if you want to reach out to me and David, you can send an email to, um, well, we, well, how about we have them tweet at us? Yeah, that's easiest in the short yeah. term, I think. So yeah. Tweet at me, Blake Oliver, at Blake T. Oliver. And I'm at David Leary. So just harass us on Twitter. And uh, let us know if you want to be a guest. Awesome. This is great. Uh, it's, I have a feeling like we're going to get really good at this. It's going to flow smooth in the future. This is cool. I'm really yeah, excited this, about this. This was pretty terrible, but I'm sure it'll be good. <laughs> we can only go up from here. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Awesome. Bye. Bye, everybody.